way, by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, let's have a few moments of silent prayer to make sure we are spiritually prepared to study the word this evening. Then I will, I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, again, it's good that we can be here this evening to be an encouragement to one another, to be encouraged by your word, to study your word and have the fellowship around the truth that is there. As our Lord prayed, we, if we know the truth, the truth will set us free, and it, we are sanctified by means of your truth. And it is only as we study your word that we come to understand things as they, as they really are. Father, we pray, too, for those in our congregation who are uh, facing various uh, challenges through uh, serious illnesses. We pray that you would encourage them and their families and strengthen them and that your presence would be a very real and present help in their time of need. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles to Exodus, Exodus chapter 14. And since we're talking about Israel, I thought I would give you an update on my little report on the trip. Uh, this last weekend, I went to Washington, D.C. for the uh, annual APAC uh, uh, policy meeting. This is the, the APAC, for those of you who don't know, is the American Israel Policy Affairs Committee. And it has been in existence for about 50 years or so, and it is the largest uh, lobby organization uh, for the support of the state of Israel. In, in the United States, it is a uh, bipartisan or nonpartisan, actually, uh, nonpartisan organization. So they always have an equal number of speakers from both parties that come. And uh, it's always interesting. And this was the second year that I had gone. And it seems like things happen in and around and as a result of the, um, of the APAC conference. And so I knew it would be interesting this year to go because just prior to the APAC conference, about a week before, uh, Vice President Biden had been in Israel, and this is when the word came out about these uh, new home uh, starts, homes that were going to be built uh, for Jews in East Jerusalem, and he uh, got upset about that, although there had never been to that point any official agreement about uh, home starts or new construction in uh, East Jerusalem. Agreements had been reached regarding the West Bank, and during the last uh, year or so since uh, uh, Netanyahu has been prime minister, they've made a number of advances in relationship to um, uh, trying to help build the economy and the infrastructure uh, in the West Bank. And there have been a number of checkpoints that were uh, sh- shut down, taken out of the way, mostly to enable uh, goods to flow into the West Bank, and, and they r- went through a list of different things that had been accomplished during the last year in terms of building the, allowing goods to go into the West Bank so that um, the the structure within the West Bank, uh, you know, new shopping centers and malls and cineplexes and different things like that have been built. And most of that was covered in the introduction. You can go online to APAC.org and click on the link to uh, to the conference and watch the videos that they've put up related to the, the speakers in all of the plenary sessions. There are about uh, five plenary sessions, and that, that's when they bring in the... Uh, Big name speakers, and and they were they're pretty interesting. And uh, then and during the afternoon there were breakout sessions, and those are also interesting. I went to one on uh, the, the the what's going on with had to do with what's going on with Hezbollah, and I went to another one that had to do with what's going on with Hamas and Iran and the connections there. And then two of the other breakout sessions I went to were really the same topic, and that was the topic of. Um, Friends of Faith Understanding Our Evangelical Allies, and I'll say a word about that uh, that in a minute. The opening uh, plenary session dealt with uh, this whole theme of economic development in Israel and how much Israel has grown 
uh, economically, business-wise, all that they have accomplished in the last 62 years since they uh, were declared their independence in 1948. And it was, it was pretty interesting. There were two panel, panels. Um, the first panel focused on more on various business-related uh, issues, and the second one dealt more with uh, uh, foreign policy and some other things. And both of those sessions were led by Dan Sr. Now, Dan Sr. used to be with um, – well, he started off as a uh, uh, working for a Republican congressman from somewhere up north, Michigan, I think, and then later he did some work with uh, Fox News. He was the, a uh, he was involved as a uh, correspondent with the with the troops when they went into Iraq in 2001 2002. He held a position in the Bush administration, so he's had quite a bit of experience. He is also a um, uh, very involved within the Jewish community, and he has just published a book called The Startup Nation, The Story of Israel's Economic Miracle, which I would encourage you to read. It's uh, fascinating what that little nation does. I mean, this country is not even bigger than New Jersey, and they have the second highest number of, of new business startups in the world next to the United States, and they invest more money per capita than any other uh, nation in the in the world on uh, research and development and the number of things that have come out of the uh, technology and business in Israel has just been phenomenal. It just, uh, and, and the way they have, they have a, a developed a culture that promotes uh, risk-taking and venture capital type projects and things of this nature, uh, really interesting. It has a whole section on how the, the interplay between the military and how the military decision making, the structure of uh, the chain of command in the military, how that operates, and how that trains because of the universal military service for all the uh, uh, young men and women in Israel, how that builds and teaches them about leadership and risk taking and initiative. And then when they get out of the military, then there is a, a smooth uh, connection between the military and business, so they transfer our transition into business very smoothly, and what they've learned in the military also has application in business, unlike in the United States when most uh, people in business don't have a clue what goes on in the military. And, in fact, military officers in the U.S. are taught to downplay and minimize their military experience when they get, retire out of the military and go into business because it doesn't communicate. And, uh, in fact, uh, people who have been in the military for 40 years have to somehow act like they haven't been in the military uh, in order to um, communicate to biz the, the business community here. We just don't have a good connection between the military and the business, and people in business never were in the military, so they really don't understand how the skills transfer over. For example, you get a young captain now who's been over in Iraq a couple of times. He's functioned as a mayor. He's functioned as a you know, water service project manager. He's functioned as a sanitation director. I mean, he's worn 15 or 20 different hats, yet when he gets out, the fact that he was an infantry captain is all that a, uh, a business uh, looks at, and they don't understand the dynamics of, of what was going on there. So that was, I found that to be a, a fascinating type of, of uh, session. And personally, just as a, as a pastor and a leader, I thought that things like that are good for me because it puts me totally out of my normal uh, you know, field of operations and challenges me and gives me new ideas and things of that, and think, new things to think about. The sessions in the afternoon related to uh, the uh, e evangelical support for Israel were also very, uh, very interesting. I was only going to go to one of them simply because uh, there may be an opportunity for me to address and speak to, speak to some Jewish groups. And so I wanted to find out what, what kind of questions are being asked, how are they being answered, what are the issues, just for my own uh, personal education so that I don't do something answer a question wrong or do something silly. And um, this, I'd, I had gone to the same session last year and had met one of the uh, individuals who was on the panel this year, a Susan Michael, who is with the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem, which is a 
pro-Israel uh, group that has a ministry there in Israel. They're not dispensational, but they are premillennial, and they are, um, in, you know, much in support of Israel. And she was on the panel last year, and they had some good discussions last year, and I had had some email interchange with her over the last year, which established a certain measure of least knowledge of who I was and credibility. Because, and that was good, because in one of her the questions that she fielded, and she had to field several of the tougher questions because the two evangelical pastors that they put up there to help her just, in my opinion, did not have the what they needed, the training, background, education, or whatever, to answer some of the questions. One question was asked by a rabbi, what is the rapture and how does that relate to support evangelical support for Israel? And the answer that, to that is, basically the one she gave, it has nothing to do with evangelical support for Israel. You don't want to get trapped in a situation like that, talking about details of Christian doctrine, when, when people don't have a frame of reference for understanding uh, those kinds of doctrines. Because all it's going to generate is confusion, uh, 1 Corinthians 2.16, that the natural man... Or 2.14, the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. And so you don't get trapped in that. And she did a great job. She said, you know, there's all kinds of prophet, prophecy interpretations. The Jews have many different interpretations of prophecy. Christians have many different interpretations of prophecy. Most of the prophetic interpretations related to Israel that evangelicals rely on are found in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, Old Testament books. And uh, yet these positions have nothing to do with why evangelicals support Israel. They, they support Israel because of Genesis 12, because God said, those who bless you, I will bless, and we just want to be blessed. And so she did a great job. And then she said, um, you know, but there are a few groups that have some odd views, and, but that doesn't represent mainstream evangelicals. She said, I understand there's a film that's being passed around the Jewish community and that has uh, surfaced and has a, uh, been having some sort of uh, negative impact in Israel called Waiting for Armageddon. Now, for those of you who know that, that features a lot of people we know and love from this congregation because that documentary was filmed using a lot of people here, some from Preston City, and was put together by some people, about, and it came out and was released about a year ago at the Jewish Film Festival in New York. And it really twists and distorts our position. And when she mentioned that, that was the first time I've heard anybody but us aware of that. I just wanted to sort of sink through the floor. But she knew me. I mean, when I'd walked in, she had recognized me and said hello and called me by name and knew who I was, introduced me to a couple of people. So I knew that if she had seen it, she would have made a connection. And uh, she hadn't seen it. And so afterwards, after everybody had left, uh, we... Uh, went out and sat down and had a, a cup of water and talked about some things, and I asked her what impact that was having. And she said she really didn't think it was having much, but she had only had a couple of emails last year about it, and then suddenly in the last two or three months, it seems to have become known in Israel, and some questions were being raised, and they were getting some emails. And so at that point, I told her what the background was and who that I was in it and that several people in our congregation were in it, others were in it, and identified who everybody was and said nobody in that group holds to this th some of these views that we're, it's, it's suggested or implied that we hold to. And she understood that. I said, it just like last year was the first time I understood that there is a the anti-Zionist crowd in America, whether they're liberal, whatever they are, the ones that are anti-Israel, want to drive a wedge of suspicion and distrust between uh, Jews and evangelicals because there are a number of those in Israel who do look with suspicion upon evangelical support. They're not sure what the motive is. And on the other hand, there are a number that, that uh, recognize this is very good, very wonderful. And among many of the people there at the conference, uh, John Hagee has a, has a very good reputation, and they are very pleased with the support that comes from evangelicals. But one of the lies that is put out there is that the reason evangelicals want to, uh, want to get all the Jews back in the land is they're just consumed with prophecy and they want to get all the Jews back in the land because then Jesus will come back and at the Battle of Armageddon, all the Jews will be killed. 
So see, they're really anti-Semitic. And what the editors of that film did was they made it sound as if that was what we believed. The first time I got through seeing the, the trailer for it, I thought they've made us look like a bunch of anti-Semites. And so it's time for a little damage control, and that's why I was talking to Susan, and then uh, she was leaving the next day to go to Jerusalem and have a meeting with the board of ICEJ and the executive director there, and they're constantly fighting this kind of attack in Jerusalem. So they were, in fact, I had several emails from her today, and they're discussing various options that we could uh, use for damage control. And even last year when we first saw it come out, I did meet with some people here in Houston uh, about producing another video that would be a rebuttal, uh, not in a negative sense, but a positive statement of what we believe, not specifically going after that, because I don't think that's the way it should be done. It shouldn't be a specific attack on what they've done, but should be a positive statement of what we believe and why we support uh, the, uh, Israel and understanding and bringing into it a lot of factors related to the history of, of Christian Zionism, things that I've taught here in the Israel Past, Present, and Future series and uh, things like that. So there's always something interesting going on and so that, that affects us in our little corner of the world but of course the bigger story, the major story that uh, was impacting things at, at APAC was the relationship between uh, Netanyahu and uh, uh, President Obama. Uh, Netanyahu gave a rousing speech on Monday night, which was excellent. And you could have seen me in the crowd. I was the little white dot that cut, took up one and a half pixels uh, off in the far left corner. Uh, there, that conference center is about 100 yards long on the inside. And so there, they pack about 8,000 people in there. And the logistics of serving 8,000 kosher meals in about 30 minutes is, is pretty remarkable. And of course, before that, uh, after the morning meeting where uh, Secretary, Secretary of State Clinton spoke, now that was interesting because the chairman of the board for APAC came out and spoke before she did, and so while she's back behind the curtain waiting, he is lowering the boom on why Jerusalem is not a settlement. It is the undivided capital of a nation. And you don't treat Jerusalem as if it is a settlement. It's not up for grabs like settlements in the West Bank. And then she came out and she, uh, in her speech, uh, said a number of things that, of course, uh, were very uh, welcome to hear. And so there were a lot of periods where they, she got her little standing ovations. But when it came to dealing with the issues of what was going on in Jerusalem, the response was rather tepid. And since that, her speech... And when Netanyahu came out that night emphasizing, again, that Jerusalem is not a settlement, uh, since then he met twice the next day with uh, President Obama, where he was treated as if he was uh, uh, you know, a servant who needed to come in the back door. No pictures were taken of them meeting together, and there are several articles that have come out in a variety of different publications, the New York Times, I mean, New, uh, excuse me, London Times, a couple of different articles today, articles yesterday that came out, uh, and numerous uh, Jewish leaders from Ed Koch, who's the former mayor of New York, to uh, um, a number of others have come out, and, and congressmen as well, coming out and just uh, decrying the way the White House and the administration ha is dealing with Israel. The last thing we need is a president who's an anti-Semite, and a week before the meeting, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's brother-in-law in Israel stated that he, he believed that President Obama was an anti-Semite. And today I saw in a picture in the article, in uh, one of the articles in the uh, London Times, was a poster in Israel. He had a young boy looking at this poster, and it's a picture of uh, Pro President Obama, probably when he was in Cairo last year, receiving an award from uh, someone dressed in full Arab garb. And the caption on the picture said, Beware. There's a Palestinian agent in the White House. So this is really escalating, and we always have to remember that there are many different forms, many different ways in which anti-Semitism rears its ugly head. And since 
uh, World War II and the Holocaust to be anti-Semitic is not acceptable. That's not politically correct. But to be anti-Israel and anti-Zionist is politically acceptable. And so anti-Zionism is the new anti-Semitism. And don't let anybody confuse you into saying that, that it's not. Because it is. Uh, Israel has a right to be a nation. It was founded with more legal pronouncements than any other nation in history. The UN made a number of, of uh, statements that were recognized and voted on by the UN and by the uh, international community. And so when they declared their independence on May the 14th, 1948, it was with the full backing of the international community. And then uh, since then, uh, they have come under attack again and again and again. And the UN has uh, put out more uh, negative resolutions against Israel than um, than any, hardly any against the Arabs, but uh, numerous ten, uh, dozens and dozens of negative uh, resolutions against uh, against Israel. And this is this all of this anti-Zionism is just veiled anti-Semitism. The Jews have a right to have a nation. They have a right to have their national homeland. And anybody who has a nation has the right to defend itself. And yet when it comes to the nation Israel, when they have rockets launched at them indiscriminately day in and day out, thousands of rockets, as Hamas and Hezbollah have done, they, their reaction is with a restraint that we would never have in this country. Look at what happened on 9-11, and we sent armies into two nations, into Afghanistan and Iran, in, in response to that. Uh, Israel isn't any larger than East Texas, and if uh, the Mexican government launched one missile into East Texas, I can pretty much guarantee you that the Texas National Guard would be standing on the, would be a victorious army standing on the shores of the Pacific in about 30 days because that's how this country is. But when you can't apply that standard to Israel. Israel lives by, a, by a, a standard unique among all the nations in the world, and that is just an example of the fact that we live in uh, the angelic conflict, and we live in the devil's world, and they are the target. So it was, it's fascinating. One of the great things that I appreciate about going to that conference is the personal contacts and, and communication that I have with a number of people and a lot, several people this year that I had met last year, met again this year, some new people that I met this year would ask me privately those same questions. Why do Christians support Israel? What, does, what, do, you, what do Christians think the, the Bible says about the future for Israel? What do you think is going to happen over there? Um, you know, what, what, do you, what is this thing we hear called, called the rapture? Well, why do you think that Jesus is the Messiah? So those are uh, interesting questions to uh, get the opportunity to answer. So let's turn to Exodus 14 so we can focus on uh, <clears throat> some doctrine this evening. This is one of those fabulous stories, great stories, great drama in history as we see the uh, great underdog of the Jewish nation leaving, uh, leaving slavery in Egypt, and then the Pharaoh changes his mind and starts to pursue them to wipe them out. Now, all of this is in the context of our study of Hebrews chapter 11, and we have come to those verses in Hebrews 11, 23 to 29, which focus on the faith of Moses. Actually, the first example is the faith related to his parents. By faith, his parents hid him. Secondly, by faith, Moses refused to be identified as Egyptian royalty uh, because he considered the uh, reproach of Christ to be greater, of greater value than the riches of Egypt. And then by faith Moses left Egypt. And in, this is stated in Hebrews 11.27, by faith he left Egypt, he departed Egypt, not, not because he was afraid of the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. This is really, in the Old Testament, it's occupation with God. He is so focused on God's will and God's plan that that blots out everything else. In the New Testament, we have occupation with Christ. But you see all of this in, within the context of Hebrews 11 is leading to that key verse for occupation with Christ in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, fixing our uh, eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So M Moses manifests that same kind of faith. And then the next verse, verse 28, talks about by faith Moses kept the Passover. We looked at that the last few weeks, recognizing that the Passover 
uh, stood for all of the ten plagues, the ten judgments God brought against the Egyptians, culminating in that great final plague where the firstborn, and this would include the firstborn males of, e of Egypt and Israel, not the females, but the firstborn males. That's the, the, the role of primogenitor inheritance went to the firstborn male in the house. And so that is the, that's the focus. And we studied the ten plagues culminating in the final plague, the death of the firstborn. And then that brought us uh, to a study of the Passover the last time, seeing that in the New Testament, the Passover becomes the type of the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul said, Christ is our Passover who was sacrificed for us. Peter recognized this in 1 Peter 1, uh, 18 and 19, that we were saved, redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, is of a lamb without spot or blemish, connecting the uh, lamb, sacrificial paschal lamb, to the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And then uh, uh, recognizing this was God's plan from the beginning, Revelation 13, 8, he is the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the earth. Now, once the Passover occurred... And God uh, redeemed them from Egypt, and the Pharaoh let them go. Then they, there's going to be some challenges because the redemption pictures salvation, but what follows salvation is spiritual growth and learning to trust God. And so Israel has to learn to trust God to give them the victory in the spiritual life. And the same thing is true for us that after we are saved, we have to learn how to walk. And we walk not by sight, but we walk by faith. Second Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by uh, faith and not by sight. We have to learn how to walk depending upon the Lord Jesus Christ and not get our eyes on circumstances, not get our eyes on our emotions, not get our eyes on any of the details of life. But remember that no matter how horrible things may look, either from a personal vantage point or from a national vantage point, that God still has a plan and God is still in control. And his plan for your next 20, 30, 40, 50 years may not be the plan that you had, but that's what we have to learn to do. We have to get over it and orient our thinking to his thinking and become oriented to his plan for our lives and the mission that he has given every believer to be an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we just don't know where that ambassador ministry is going to take us. It may involve uh, ministry in our neighborhoods. It may involve ministry in... Um, may involve ministry at, at a place of our employment. It may involve ministry with people we just run into at the uh, uh, grocery store or some other place. And it may be that you're spending 40 years of training in Bible class so that you're going to have a tremendous ministry in prison the last five years of your life. We never know just how that is going to play itself out. And there are uh, numerous examples throughout history of believers who have gone through just that kind of thing. And uh, we don't want it to be true, but God is always going to give us the grace and the ability to handle whatever situation and circumstance uh, comes our way. And so the last example of faith in the life of Moses is stated in Hebrews 11, uh, 29. By faith they pass through the Red Sea as dry land. Now the subject is they. It's not just Moses, it is the entire body of Israelites. They as a corporate group, they are identified with Moses and his faith because that's where they, where they want to be identified. This is one of those passages that indicates the uh, almost universal salvation of the Exodus generation. They trusted God to deliver them in the, at the night of the Passover. They're trusting God at the Red Sea again and again and again. They trust God, and then they turn right around, and they disobey Him, and they're as uh, rebellious and as grumpy as they can be, and they want to go back to Egypt because they want to go back and get their Mexican food. Oh, excuse me, I got that wrong. They're, they're garlic and leeks. And they want to go back and have something that tastes a little better than, than uh, uh, the angel food that God has been given, giving them. And so they show that they're just not grace-oriented at all. They have no appreciation for all that God provides for them. So we're told by faith they pass through the Red Sea as by dry land, 
whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. And this emphasizes God's judgment on the Egyptian army, that it was completely wiped out at that particular time, and wiped out, and this finished the process of destroying the entire culture and civilization of of Egypt, at least for a time. Now let's look at the description of this in uh, Exodus chapter 14. Now we'll start off just a little before that. Um, Let's go back to verse 17 of chapter 13. It came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines. Now, here is a map. I'm going to go back and forth between several different maps to point out some different things uh, in here. And I know that a lot of people are uh, geographically challenged. I love sitting and poring over maps. And what we have here is a p- pretty accurate picture of the ancient world. Here is uh, Lower Egypt. Remember, Upper Egypt is upper because of elevation, so that's in the south where the Nile begins, and then uh, Lower Egypt is really Northern Egypt. This is the area here where they have marked uh, the cities of Pithom and Ramses. This is the Red Sea. Actually, the term Red Sea is a late term. The, the term in the Hebrew is Reed Sea. And it does, it becomes Red Sea. We're not sure where or when or how it becomes uh, Red Sea, but that is a, a name that does go back into antiquity. And often the term Red Sea is associated with both of these gulfs. The gulf here on the left is actually the Gulf of Suez, and the gulf on the right over here, if you're Arab, it's the Gulf of Aqaba. If you are uh, Jewish, it is the Gulf of Elat. A lot is right at the northern tip here of the uh, of the Gulf of Elat, and this is the southern tip of modern state of, of Israel. And so we're not sure. The Bible doesn't really specify exactly where uh, this sea is that they crossed. One thing we do know is from ancient records is that the um, if you see up here that the the, the uh, where the Mediterranean Sea is, it comes much further south than it does at modern times. The border of the Mediterranean Sea is much further up today than it was in the ancient world. And the uh, Gulf of Suez went much further north than it did does in modern times. Now, this area between the Mediterranean and the Gulf of Suez is where they dug out the channel that is now the Suez Canal. But So the topography today is not what it was uh, in the ancient world. And there were a series of lakes between these two areas, a series of waterways, and we're not exactly sure what they look like because there's, uh, there's, there's no evidence that survived from that time in history. But it seems that when the, uh, we read the account here in, in Exodus 13 that the Israelites don't go very far before they cross the Red Sea. Now, some have suggested that the there is a um, that the Sinai and the crossing of the Red Sea was uh, somewhere over somewhere in in this area. Let's see if I can. There's my arrow. That on the Gulf of Alot over here, and that the. Uh, J- J- uh, Jabal al Laws over right in this area here is where Mount Sinai was actually located, and that Midian uh, was over in this area, and that is uh, not demonstrable. Uh, they would have had to go a long way from Egypt before they crossed the Red Sea, whereas the text seems to suggest that it was something that happened uh, very early on before they made uh, a, 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 some lengthy travels. So the usually you see, and in this map here, if you can see the little yellow triangles with the black dot, every one of those yellow triangles with the black dot represents a, and it has a name uh, next to it related to a mountain, but each of those triangles with the black dot indicates a different location, possible location for, the, for Mount Sinai that's been suggested. So there's no certainty. The traditional site is down here, uh, Jebel Musa, 
that's down here in the southern tip of the Sinai Peninsula, but that doesn't really fit the the um, description in the in the biblical text. Here's another map uh, showing the the routes. The this is the way the highway that was the way to the land of the Philistines across the north here, but uh, Sinai was not part of Egypt. It was the area that was between Egypt to the west and Philistia to the uh, uh, to the east. And it, there were several uh, uh, fortifications along the way to protect travelers and to protect the trade routes for the Egyptians. And so that was not the way for the, for the Israelites to travel. So this is just another shot of the Red Sea from Mount uh, Zeph- Zephahot and gives you a little bit of an idea of the rugged terrain that they were going through. So they're not traveling very fast if they're having to go through that kind of terrain. You're fortunate if you're moving three or four miles a day when you have uh, a couple of million people that you're trying to take care of. Back up to a map here. So let's just read along in the text. So verse 17, they did not go by the uh, way of the land of the Philistines. They went much further south to avoid any confrontations with uh, Egyptian military forces. Verse 18, God led them around by way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he placed the children of Israel under solemn oath. That is, Joseph had made them swear to take his bones back to, uh, back to the land. And in verse 20 we read, So they took their journey from Sukkoth, and camped in Etham at the edge of the wilderness. Now that is this area just to the... Uh, just to the west of these lakes connecting the the Gulf of Suez to the Mediterranean. You see it a little better in this map. Up here you have, this is the location of uh, Pithom, and this black dot here is the location of Sukkot. So this places them in this area very soon after they, they left Egypt. And the Lord is leading them in somewhat of a circuitous route through the desert, that's we think of wilderness, we think of something a little bit different in American history. Wilderness is really a desert, uh, the desert area. So there, the Lord's taking them a circuitous route in order to confuse uh, the, the Egyptians in their pursuit. Verse 21, the Lord is leading them. And that is a key principle that we have for divine guidance is that God always leads us. He leads us today by His Word. He leads us by His revelation. He's not going to stick a, a tower, a pillar of fire out in front of you or a cloud out in front of you. He's put the Word of God out in front of you. And that is what gives us guidance today. That is the light that He has given us. Now, in chapter 14, we read, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they turn in camp before pi Hahiroth between Migdal and the sea opposite Baal Zephon, you shall camp before it by the sea, because Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. See, they're wandering around and they're lost. And I, God said in verse 4, Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army. Now I want you to note as we read through this section all the times Pharaoh's name is mentioned, because he, he all of a sudden he stops being mentioned once they start the pursuit across the Red Sea, which I think is significant. Uh, up till then, it's Pharaoh and his army, Pharaoh and his army, Pharaoh and his army, Pharaoh and his army, and then it's just his army. So that, I think that solves the question of why we don't have a record of, of a Pharaoh being killed at this time is because he didn't follow his army uh, into, the, uh, into the sea. Now, verse 5 we read, Now, um, it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants were turned against the people, and they said, why have we done this? Just typical of anybody who gives something up that they really enjoy. Five minutes later, they're doing it again. You know, Just think of anybody who's tried to quit smoking or tried to go on a diet or any number of other things we try to give up, and then the next day we're doing it again. And that's what happened with them. They uh, gave up their slaves, and now all of a sudden they're having to wash their clothes and go to the grocery store and all of the other things. And so they decide, why, why did we give, give it up? People have a very short attention span, especially when there are spiritual issues involved. So Pharaoh got his army ready, and he took 600 choice chariots, 
and all of the chariots of Egypt with the captains over every one of them. So he takes his entire chariot corps with him out into to pursue the uh, Israelites. And here we have a illustration of the different types of chariots that the uh, is, Israelites had. So this is their light cavalry in pursuit of the uh, of the Israelites. And we're told in verse nine that they pursued them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen, his army, and overtook them camping by the sea beside Pi Hahiroth before Baal Zephon. So once again, we're back here in this same area, located up right up here. This is uh, they. So they have their backs to the sea. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and they saw the Egyptians, and they were what? They were afraid. Now, I'm emphasizing this because when we get over into uh, Psalm 78, what we learn is they're not afraid once they start trusting God. That the only way to deal with fear is to trust God and realize that God is greater than anything that we could possibly uh, that we could possibly fear. So they initially, they're afraid, and they what do they do? They cry out to the Lord. That's what we're supposed to do whenever we encounter any kind of uh, challenge, difficulty in life. And then they begin to complain. See, that's what we do. What am I supposed to do? i got to turn to God. Sometimes we do it the other way. We start complaining, then we turn to God. But we're not I- I- any better than the, uh, than the Israelites were, so we don't want to look down our, our nose at them and act as if they're... Uh, complete losers. As we're told that they start complaining with Moses, you just brought us out here in the desert so that we can all be slaughtered by the Egyptians. And then um, uh, Mo- Moses says, is this not the word that we told you in Egypt? Or, excuse me, uh, this is still the Israelites speaking in verse 12. Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. And this is another problem that we see that's going to plague this generation is they don't have a capacity for freedom. They can't handle the freedom, and they would rather stay slaves, and they keep that slave mentality, which means that they they can't handle responsibility. This is a major problem we have with this nation. We have raised a generation now, uh, uh, several generations, that become increasingly more pampered and more spoiled and more unwilling to uh, deal with the realities of life. Now, it's not the parents' fault. I know some of you and you have children that are in spiritual rebellion. And and just as uh, there have been generations in Israel's history where the children were in spiritual rebellion, the parents were not blamed. It is each generation's decision. And I am uh, become aware almost on a weekly basis of numerous Families, numerous parents who did all they could, praying for their children, taking them to church, teaching them the word, and then when their children turn into, uh, get into their 20s and the 30s, they turn their back on everything that their their uh, parents taught them and reject all of their values and reject Christianity and just live live like like the world. They have a slave mentality. And the younger generation coming up, even though there are some bright lights that I see now and then and very happy with, there are also more and more that just don't want to uh, exercise initiative, take responsibility, and take ownership for their lives. And they want the government to take care of them. They want somebody else to take care of them. And they just want to live a life uh, pursuing personal uh, pleasure and comfort. And Francis Schaeffer warned of that 30 years ago, that that was going to be the death knell of Western civilization and the United States. And that same mentality characterized the the Israelites. It is a slave mentality, uh, refusal to accept responsibility for their own actions. But notice Moses' response. He doesn't rebuke them for being uh, slaves, for being uh, wrong, for being uh, griping and complaining. What he says, he points them to the Lord. Don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And that word salvation isn't spiritual salvation. That has to do with deliverance from this uh, crisis in their life. 
Stand still and see the deliverance of the Lord and what He will accomplish for you today. And then skip to verse 14, the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. This is a great promise. This is one of those tremendous promises that we have in Scripture that we can apply today. The same Lord that fought for them is the same Lord that fights for us. That God plus one is a majority and God is greater than any problem that we will ever face. And He was certain, and the same God that was greater than all of the might and power of the Pharaoh is greater than all the things that are arrayed against us today. And so we can trust Him and rely upon Him, and He is working. I mean, there's all kinds of things that are going on in this country that I think are there because God is not finished with the United States of America. God is not finished with us. There may be times of discipline and hardship because of the people in this nation who have rejected Him and rejected His values and rejected absolutes, but nevertheless, God is still in charge. And so in verse 15, The Lord says to Moses, Why are you crying to to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. But lift up your rod, stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Now what's interesting is there always seems to be people who try to explain these supernatural events with some sort of naturalistic explanation that there was a great wind or there was a volcano and or earthquake or something of this nature and that is not the case this is a situation where god intervened supernaturally he suspended the normal laws of uh, physics and geology and meteorology and caused the water to divide and for the ground to be dried up perfectly so that all of these people could cross over. It would have taken them forever if they had been trudging through the mud, uh, not to mention how miserable it was. And the, the parting of the sea, as we see in this particular illustration, is typically depicted for example, in uh, uh, DeMille's The Ten Commandments, as being a rather narrow opening. I think this opening was at least a mile wide, if not two or three miles wide. If you're trying to move two million people across that distance in a short amount of time, then they have to have more than a four-lane highway. They have to have an extremely wide avenue And so this opened up a huge area that was dried out uh, instantly, and the people made their way across the sea. And as they did, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Verse 17, we read, If I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them, so I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over his army, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now, for a lot of people, this sounds kind of strange. How did God gain honor over Pharaoh? How is God glorified in this? Well, let me tell you, 40 years later, when the Israelites got were crossed into the land at Jericho, uh, the, the, and the word was getting out among the Canaanites that the Israelite army was coming, they remembered this story, and they were scared to death. That is what honors God, recognizing that He is the real creator of the universe and the one who is in charge. And so the point of this was to demonstrate that God was who he claimed to be. And so verse 19, we're told, The angel of the Lord who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, blocking the Egyptian army. And the pillar went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the Egyptians and Israel. Uh, thus it was a cloud and darkness to the, Israel, to, the, to the Egyptians, rather, and it gave light by night to the other, so that one did not come near the other all that night. So it took most, uh, nearly the whole night for everybody to get across. And then when they finished, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. uh, Or, excuse me, during the night, it takes the east wind to blow it all back um, and to separate it. And then they cross in the midst of the sea, verse 22. And then... Uh, afterward, the, the, sea, the Egyptians pursued them into the midst of the sea. And then we're told, uh, notice verse 23, and the Egyptians pursued them. It's not the Pharaoh and his army anymore. It's the Egyptians pursued them and all Pharaoh's horses, not the Pharaoh and his horses, not the Pharaoh and his chariots. We lose that terminology. All of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, his horsemen uh, were destroyed uh, during the, that particular time. And so... 
uh, they were unable to follow the Israelites uh, into the Red Sea. Now, Psalm 136, 15 uh, describes this same event and talks about God overthrowing Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. But the word for overthrowing is na'ar, meaning to shake or shake out or, or to destroy, and does not mean uh, necessarily that the Pharaoh was drowned in the, um, in the sea when the waters covered them, as described in verses 27 uh, down through uh, 28. And so the conclusion is given in verses 30 and 31. So the Lord delivered Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Again, an indication of their, of their salvation. Now, this whole event is picked up in the New Testament and used as an illustration of a spiritual reality for the church age believer. And it shows that there is a parallel between these two events. In Israel, you have the redemption of the people from slavery in Egypt, which is parallel to the redemption of the believer from slavery to sin. We're born in bondage to the sin nature. Romans chapter 6, Paul says, but we were, uh, we, we were saved, we were delivered, therefore no longer live as slaves to unrighteousness, but live as slaves to righteousness. So there is a shift that takes place when we are saved, we're freed from that the tyranny of the sin nature, uh, we still sin, but it no longer has that same dominion just as the uh, Jews no longer were under the dominion and tyranny of the Pharaoh. But they wanted to go back there, just as you and I want to go back and let the sin nature uh, have control over us. So redemption is pictured uh, there with the, uh, <coughs> with the picture of the Passover. Now, the next thing that happens is there is an identification that takes place with Moses. And this happens at the Red Sea. And we see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2, that all were baptized into Moses by means of, that's the phraseology here, the Greek preposition in indicates means or instrumentality, by means of the cloud and by means of the sea. Now, all indicates the uh, Israelites. Baptism doesn't mean, uh, I mean, its its literal meaning is immersion, to dip or plunge something into something else, usually something that is wet. But baptism had a significance that went beyond the simple idea of immersion. And the, because if you notice here, those who went into the sea, the ones who got wet, the one who were immersed in water were the Egyptians, not the Israelites. But the Israelites are the ones who are uh, baptized into Moses. And the, the significance of baptism is always identification with something for the purpose of showing entrance into a new aspect of life, a new dimension, a transition into something uh, new, a totally new condition. So in many passages, you will get the meaning or the sense of baptism if you simply substitute the word identify with the word baptism. For example, we're all baptized into the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We are identified with that death, burial, and resurrection. In the same sense here, in 1 Corinthians 10.2, the Israelites were baptized or identified with Moses' faith so that his faith and their faith in God are all one and they are identified and the event that does that is the cloud and the sea. The cloud is a reference to the uh, Lord, I believe the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ who is represented in the pillar of fire and the cloud who is leading them, and the sea which brought judgment upon the nation. Now this is a really important verse for understanding these baptism passages, and especially the whole concept of baptism, uh, the baptism by means of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to notice here that you have the word baptized that is a passive. So somebody performs the action. Who performed the action of that verb? Well, the grammatical subject is all, 
but we're not told who performs the action. God is the one who performs the action. He's an unstated subject. Now, the, the thing into which the baptism identifies is indicated by the Greek preposition ace, and this is true in all of the baptism passages. And the instrument that's used to effect or to bring about this identification is always indicated by an in preposition. It's, it's a formula that, that we have. Now, this helps us understand what this picture is because the picture of the baptism into Moses is a type of the baptism uh, by means of the Holy Spirit. When the Israelites were on one side of the Red Sea, they were still in the territory of Egypt, and they were fleeing slaves. But when they come out on the other side, they've been identified with, with Moses, and they're a new nation. Now, we see the same kind of formula in other baptism statements. For example, in Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist is speaking, and he said, As for me, I baptize you. Now, this is an active voice verb. The one who performs the action is John the Baptist, first person pronoun, I. And he's baptizing you, that is, the uh, the the people, with water. And that's indicated by the Greek preposition in plus the noun for water. And the purpose or the new state is indicated by repentance. That's what they're being identified with. Why are they coming down? Because he preached a message saying repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the instrument is water that is used to identify them as one who had repented of the legalism of Judaism and was identifying with a changed heart towards God, understanding repentance. You have to go back to Deuteronomy 30 and the uh, call and the statement that God made that in the future the people would turn to God or repent and he would then restore them to the land and establish the kingdom. So the first part of that verse deals with John. Then he says, in reference to Christ, He who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So John uses water. Jesus is going to use the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 10, God used the, the cloud and the sea to effect that identification. And so we see God will baptize you in numity and in purity, that is, with fire. Now, the point I'm making is you always have to identify these prepositions. The in clause is always going to represent the means or instrument, and the ace clause is going to always indicate the goal, the direction, the new state in which they are identified. Now, we see the same thing in Jesus' statement in Acts 1.5. He said, for John baptized, John, you and then the verb is active voice. John is the one who did the action with water, by means of water. So the, the trouble that we get into in English is some translators use the preposition with to translate in. Others use the preposition in to translate the Greek preposition in. And so people came along and said, oh, over here it's baptized with the Spirit. Over here it's baptized in the Spirit. We have two different baptisms. But in the Greek it was all the same phrase. One baptism. So uh, John said, I mean, Jesus said, for John baptized you by means of water, but you will be baptized by means of the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 13, we're told that let me see if I get them all. There we go. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we're told, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. The by one Spirit doesn't mean the Spirit baptizes us. It didn't mean that in Matthew three eleven. didn't mean that in 1 Corinthians 10, 2 or in Acts 1. The Spirit isn't the one who baptizes us into Christ. Jesus is the one who uses the Spirit to, to bring us into identification with His death, burial, and resurrection. And that is depicted by the verse that we looked at in 1 Corinthians 10, 2. So when we think of the Passover, what do you think about? You think of redemption. Passover is next week. Then you think of the, exod uh, the, the uh, Red Sea, passing through the Red Sea. You should think of identification with Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection so that after that we are something new. We are a new 
creature in Christ. Old things have passed away. So let's close by going back to Hebrews very quickly and just wrapping up what we've, what we've done here. We've gone through this section here with Moses. Second longest section next to the one dealing with the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, dealing with Moses and his, his faith, that, that the faith of his parents to save him, to deliver him uh, during the time when Pharaoh was seeking to kill all the young uh, children in the land, all the young boys. Uh, verse 24, Moses, uh, by faith, refused to be identified with the royal household of Pharaoh. Uh, then in verse 20, uh, 26, he refused to uh, stay with the uh, riches of Egypt, preferring the reproach of Christ. Verse 27 uh, is the third example. By faith he left Egypt because he didn't fear the anger of the king. And then the uh, fourth example, by faith he kept the Passover. Fifth example, by faith they passed through the Red Sea. That ends the major section here in Hebrews 11 in dealing with all of these examples. Now we're going to have a few more examples, but the writer runs through them very quickly. He's going to talk about Jericho, Rahab, uh, talk about the judges in verse 32. And, but the whole point of this is that we can follow them in trusting God. Just because it's Old Testament doesn't mean it doesn't relate. The, the example of faith in the promise of God is just as integral to the spiritual life of the church age believer it was to the spiritual life of the Old Testament believer. We have more. But the basic issue in the Christian life is still trusting in the promise of God. It's like the old hymn, trust and obey, trust and obey, uh, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Nothing else works without basic trust in the promise of God, and that produces that the, our ability to relax and to enjoy all that he has for us, even when everything's falling apart around us. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study your word, to be challenged by the things that we have studied. Father, we continue to pray for Israel. We pray for the leaders in this nation that they would realize that uh, supporting Israel does not necessarily mean we validate everything they, they uh, decision they make, but it does mean that we need to support their right to national defense and to national security just as any other nation. And we need to treat them just like we treat any other nation and we also need to, to realize that uh, the, those who s claim to be uh, wanting peace, the, the Palestinians, those who are making these, these other claims are simply, it's, it's just words. It doesn't mean anything. Arafat proved that uh, at um, Camp David 10 years ago that no matter what Israel gives up, uh, the Palestinians don't want it because their goal is something else, the destruction of Israel. So, Father, we pray that you would strengthen them, strengthen our nation. We pray for wisdom. We pray that you'd raise up uh, men and women who understand uh, the true nature of things, who could lead this nation, and that can perhaps uh, lead us back away from this brink of self-destruction that we've come to in, uh, in this self-absorbed nation of ours. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.